Welcome to the final episode of our quest series, everyone. We'll be diving into some really great discussion with Kyle and Russ shortly, but for now, some announcements. First up, we want to give a shout out to Kyle Allen, one of the guests on this episode, who recently came out with a quest supplement that, if you are listening to the series, may be of interest to you. It's an adventure profile that you can fill out with your group, much in the same vein as the character creation Mad Lib format, to flesh out your group's adventure, which sounds pretty cool. Um, we'll have a link to that in the show notes for you. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I know I'm I'm currently working on a quest supplement myself, uh, adding a magical girl's role to quest RPG, of course, uh, because if I see an RPG that allows for customization, I my first question is, can I magical girls in it? Yep. Um, so hopefully I will have that uh, sometime soon for everybody to get on my itch page. Uh, but uh, Chimera is actually coming along very well. The next version is almost finished. Um, so it might be difficult to get that done soon. Uh, but uh, Amara and I, uh, Amara is on Twitter. Uh, I've actually started streaming uh, together on Amara's Twitch page. Um, and we just did our, our first one this last Saturday. And you can get the video on demand if you're interested in hearing, what, three and a half hours of us uh reworking the playbooks together cool um yeah it was really interesting uh but uh, i think we're planning again for this next saturday possibly uh so we'll throw some links out on twitter when that happens uh maybe in some discords and uh just come join us ask some questions uh we'll probably do some q a and stuff too so uh it should be pretty fun very cool mm -hmm. speaking of very cool time for a review yeah <laughs> Uh, this one is from Ryuku or Ryuk00, not sure, uh, from the United States on iTunes, titled Deeper Than It Would Seem. As an up-and-coming designer, I stumbled across this while checking out various roleplay podcasts. I thought at least I would get to see some different systems. But what Amelia and Ryan give is so much more. You learn how developers think and feel, their inspirations and struggles, and why and how they got into developing RPGs. On the flip side, you get to hear from players on their favorite games and what they want in games, as well as how to get the most out of your experiences playing games. All the while, Ryan and Amelia are genuine and sincere in their interest and positive energy and their, or their instant chemistry. It's a fun and wholesome listen that's become a favorite. Aw, thank you. Thank you. That was super nice. That was very nice. I like this I one a bit, very much. Yeah. With all of that out of the way, here's the episode. Enjoy. discussion episode. Last time we created characters for Quest. This episode we will be discussing the character creation process. We are excited to welcome back Kyle Allen and Russ Wild from the Prism Pals podcast. Do you want to go ahead and introduce yourselves again and tell us a little bit about the characters that you made? Oh, I'm first on the list. That's how it goes. <laughs> Hi, I'm Russ Wild. I am the guide for Prism Pals. You can find us on Twitter at Prism Pals. You can find me on Twitter at Russ Wildest. And I made Teen Beetle. Uh, they, them pronouns. I also use they, them pronouns. Not related. Uh, but they are the party's doctor. Uh, they carry a scalpel, a stethoscope, and a reflex hammer. And a bottle of apple juice. Orange juice. It's Orange a juice. juice of some sort. Some sort of a juice. constantly refilling bottle of apple juice. Yeah. That's yes. pretty amazing. Some good juice. Yeah. Speaking of juice. Kyle. <laughs> <laughs> what, a, what a segue. Hey, y'all. I'm Kyle. My pronouns are he, they. I'm also the Prison Palace podcast. Look at that. Um, you can find me on Twitter at superqueero. I almost said underscore again, but it's not there. I promise. <laughs> um, my character that I made is the party spy, uh, and their name is Juice by Lizzo. Um, 
and they are an amorphous mist person. That's just so amazing. Uh, Amelia, uh, why don't you tell us about your normal character? Am I totally <laughs> the only person that made a normal character? Yeah, that's a weird one here. Right? Playing this game wrong, apparently. Uh-huh. Uh, my character's name is Imogen Merritt. She uses she, her pronouns. Um, I am the party's invoker. Um, I have iridescent skin, though, so that's the one not normal thing about me. That is pretty cool, though. We get it, you lotion. Just like Ryan. <laughs> Just like Homer. Speaking of. Ryan, do you want to tell us about your character? Uh, so my character's name is a full of roller, uh, which is spelled exactly like it sounds. Um, <laughs> you can call them Phil. Uh, they, them pronouns. Uh, they're fairly old, a little over, uh, 3000 years old. Uh, and they can vary between 4.1 and 9.6 tentacles tall. Uh, so uh, imagine a tentacle and do 4.1 to 9.6 of those. And that's how tall they can think of me. Uh, they are the wizard of the party, and uh, they like to just uh, go with that tentacle theme. They've got tentacle hair, tentacle antennas, tentacle tentacles, uh, and tentacle weapons. Um, I've said tentacles more times right now than I probably have in my entire life, uh, but I blame Descent into Midnight for that. So, Hey, Ryan, how many tickles does it take to make an octopus laugh? Ten tickles. Ten tickles. Oh, <laughs> the jokes. Ten tickles. And that's the end of the podcast. Uh, thank <laughs> you all for coming. I think yeah. we just. I think uh, that we just was our discussion. Everything. Shut it down. Uh huh. Uh huh. <laughs> Although I am infuriated by that joke because octopi only have eight tentacles. We'll workshop it later. We'll workshop it later. That's fine. <laughs> Let's go ahead and dive right into our segment that we're calling D20 for your thoughts. D20 for your thoughts? Which is very applicable for this game. Because it's only a D20. Yeah. (laughs) It actually makes sense this time. Do you roll a D20 to determine which question you ask us? Oh, then we'd have to come up with 20 questions. We roll a D20 to see how well you answered them. Oh, good. You could make How D20 for your thoughts. How are you? You can make D20 for your thoughts a game of 20 questions. Oh, no. No, that was the last episode. <laughs> See, I so we did L5R, and that's how you create characters. You answer 20 questions. Oh, mm-hmm. really? Yep. Mm-hmm. All know. right. In this segment, we like to talk to our guests about their thoughts on the character creation process, how it relates to this system and other games that you've played. First, we like to ask a super cliche question that everybody asks anytime anyone's a guest on a podcast. How'd you get into RPGs? How did your life end up here? Well, I bet you're wondering how I ended up here. <laughs> um, <laughs> back in back in the olden days of when I was in college, not too long ago, actually, um, one of my roommates basically came up to all of us. We're all a bunch of nerds. We were playing Minecraft on a Minecraft server, like every other day so we were nerds and he came up to us very shyly and said um do you want to play pathfinder and we were like what the heck is a pathfinder <laughs> and he went it's a it's like D and we went oh sure why not and so we started playing and we had a home campaign that lasted about a year before schedules got too busy and yeah that's how i got started in rpgs and from there i kind of pushed myself further into it rather than letting anyone else guide my ship. Nice. <laughs> what about you, Kyle? I got into rocket propelled grenades by a cartel dealer. <laughs> um, I uh, was introduced to them through the show that may not be named, uh, Critical Role. Um, that was my first introduction. And then I think I started playing with a friends of mine and their kids. Hmm. And then we stopped playing because I didn't want to play with my friends and their kids anymore. <laughs> kids are the just, worst, right? I mean, they're fine. I say this as a parent. They're the yeah. worst. <laughs> <laughs> so now I don't play with friends and kids. I play with friends of four kids. Oh, Love it. there you go. Just morphed the end into a four. Yeah. Just change the, the preposition and then, then you're all good. That's cool. I don't know. Prepositions oh, don't use that word. <laughs> I can recite all of them. Please don't. <laughs> Please don't. <laughs> I will not give you a D20 for that thought. 
Maybe like a D4. D4. <laughs> oh, those are the sharpest ones when you step on them. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I'll go with the D1. Okay. Uh, can you tell us then about your personal process for picking and creating characters in any role playing game? Open the book, go to the character creation, look for the cool stuff you can do, find the one that's the coolest, pick that w- book, <laughs> play it. <laughs> literally how i get into any role-playing game so how would you define cool in that scenario um so first time i played masks i opened it i was like "Ooh, the nova they're powerful this looks cool also the art his butt cool let's do it (laughs) (laughs) that's very fair i went a very different route normally i go a very different route um normally i ask questions about the world um for the gm I ask them about, like, hey, can you tell me about the world? Can you tell me about these things? And then I ask more questions to help me flesh out a character. Um, The first character I ever made had a five-page backstory, which when I handed that to my GM, he went, I love this. Uh, He proceeded to read it all in one night and then came back to me and was like, here are some notes just for factual things. But otherwise, great. Can't wait. Um... So oftentimes it comes up with the tropes that I want to play, that kind of thing first, sort of seeing how the world is built and responding to that to build a character. And then I pick like class and other things. Um, Normally the last thing I ever pick is the name because names normally have some sort of meaning for my characters. Mm -hmm. Um, So one of the character I've played the longest, I've played him for about three years um his name he's specifically a ranger and his name comes from hindu mythology about three magical arrows um one of which marks a target one of which kills a target and one of which unmarks that target um and so that character and their name sort of have a very important meaning for me um and that's goes with a lot of my characters um i played a paladin of vengeance once whose name was Roshan, which means light. And then if you shorten that to Rosh, it means anger. And so that like very much fit the theme for him. That's very cool. I love picking character names that way. It's part of why I agonize over them for so long usually is that like it needs to like mean something that matches the like setting and the character that I'm playing. And I feel like unfortunately on this podcast, I don't get to do that very much because we don't have like hours for me to like meticulously make lists and decide which one (laughs) I want to do. Like I just sort of randomly flip through my baby name book and pick something. Mm -hmm. Um, But I love doing that. I will say that I don't always just go with the fun and stupid answer of just like picking the cool stuff. I do sometimes think about what I'm doing. My Prison Pals character was very thought out and in- in- influenced by Russ's story build, uh, world building. So I'm not a complete idiot, folks. <laughs> I never said you were a complete idiot. I, I know. I said I took a different path. <laughs> listen, I said something about butts and cool abilities, and you were like, listen, Hindu mythology, three arrows. And I was like, oh, now I look stupid. <laughs> Do you find that that's a difference for you when you play a campaign versus like a one shot, though? Oh, I, yes. I, for me, uh, oh, when I sit absolutely. down to play a one shot, I'm like, let's pick the dumb thing, or like, this art has a good butt. Like, I'm mm-hmm. with you on that. When I do a campaign, I agonize over it for like weeks and I have like stress about it. Like Absolutely. I have to make all the perfect decisions because it actually matters. Unlike on this show where I can just leave. <laughs> all of my I'm, campaign characters are like that. But like if I'm playing a one shot, like for International Podcasting Month with Ryan, I played Elle Woods from Legally Blonde as my super spy character. So <laughs> love it. <laughs> Like for me, I have uh, I have my very serious characters, and then for my one shot character, I have a Goliath named Heart Crusher, who his entire thing is he's a dumb Goliath barbarian fighter barbarian thing, and just wants to smash things, and he like found a sheep during the one shot and became obsessed with starting a sheep farm. <laughs> <laughs> and, like, I play very ridiculous characters when it's a one-shot because it feels like there's less investment there. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So if something bad happens to the character, there's less attachment to, mm-hmm. like, I want them to succeed, that kind of thing. Mm-hmm. Yeah, there's, like, I less thought about, like, I need this important redemption arc. And, mm-hmm. like, it's like, no, I just want to do cool things. Yeah. Yeah. 
It's a little liber- liberating. It is. Mm-hmm. How do you feel like character creation in this game stacks up to other games that you've played? It's easy. It's so much easier. <laughs> it it is. is. It really is. So with this game, with Quest, I think that the character creation is much more narrative style mm-hmm. of like Absolutely. you can figure it out piece by piece and the things that you choose influence the world but also influence your character all those sort of things like we were talking about with like the location of your city what is your city known for that influences the world mm-hmm. and one of the really fun things about it is that it's not like other games which are like you have to know every stage of your life you have to know every single step like burning wheels one of those games where you have to know every single step you have to know where you started where you ended where you are now that kind of thing and it very much allows you to have a free flow character who maybe they've been adventuring for a really long time or maybe they just started adventuring yesterday um, maybe they're just accidentally caught up in all this stuff. Maybe they, their dream is to sell out all their radishes this week, and suddenly they're caught up in an adventure. I think that it's very, it's, it's an easy character creation that allows for a lot of versatility in how you build your character and the different ways that a party can be made together. Um, cause even though some of us picked similar things, we have a very diverse, different party except for the fact that three of us are non-humanoid creatures Mm -hmm. and one of us picked a quote-unquote normal character yes (laughs) (laughs) it's very much like they the game is taking the long extensive build a five-page backstory and and just breaking it down into its basic parts and making it into a paragraph. You're basically making an abstract for a backstory and just mm-hmm. like mad libsing it. It's like it's it feels very simple and very direct, but you still get the same effect at the end of the day where you can build upon it. Mm-hmm. I also think that one thing that's important to recognize with this game is that it is a starter RPG. It's not like it it doesn't answer all the burning questions you have. It doesn't give you all the tools that you might want in the future, but it's a starter RPG. And for a starter RPG, not everyone's going to make a five page backstory, Mm -hmm. but it doesn't dissuade you from doing that. It doesn't tell you don't do this. If you want to make a five page backstory and send that to your guide, do it. Just make sure that like you have this profile. So when you sit at the table, you don't read your five page backstory. You read this little blurb and everyone gets a good idea of who your character is. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I like how they they pointed out that you just read this paragraph and everybody knows who you are, Uh, that that's the most important things really to to recognize if you're first meeting this person, uh, which is really interesting. Yeah. I feel like it has a little bit of that PBTA feel where it's like really easy to just sit down and like do it mm-hmm. um, without having to have a lot of system mastery, which we've covered games that have that where it's like you mm-hmm. have to really know the system to be able to create a good character. We talked a lot about that in our, our last mm-hmm. series about like how easy it is to make a bad character in some games. And this feels like you really can just come in, sit down do it and come out with something that's like flavorful but still very playable Mm -hmm. it's impossible to min max there's nothing like it there's nothing to min max Mm -hmm. like the the closest thing is picking abilities but even then it's uh, what are you gonna do you just have the better abilities off the bat but then you're missing a little bit of diversity and then if you diversify and then you're missing the better abilities and it's just you know what yeah, can but you, you can do? always like roll to do anything. So yeah, exactly. That's so, not even really a problem. There's no, there's no set skills. Uh, there's no set attributes. Nothing like that, which is very different uh, for a role playing game. I, I can't think of many that have just said there's no attributes for this game. Yeah, and everybody, everybody's on equal playing ground. I mean, I think part of that comes from the driver of the role-playing market, which is D&D and other big companies like that. Um, So because they have these attributes, because they have them, everybody expects them. And 
Um, I don't know if either of you have ever actually played Quest from the talks we've had. I don't think you have. No. No. Nope. Uh, yes. Uh, not having attributes still makes a very interesting story. Mm-hmm. Like, it still makes interesting characters, interesting story, and fun things happen. Yeah. Even just leaving it up to fate. Because I can see this putting a lot more focus on playing the character that you want to play instead of being bound to, well, my character is supposed to be super intelligent because they have a 20 intelligence score, but I don't know, you know, the left to the right side of a puzzle uh, Mm -hmm. whenever I look at it. And I don't, I'm not book smart or anything like that as a player. How is that going to translate to this character? You know, having to play into your attributes is probably kind of a, a, it, a different confined sort of shell that it, it must feel a little liberating to kind of play outside of that field. Absolutely. That's interesting. But yeah, it's simple. It's, it was, it was interesting to create our people and then pick abilities after our people were fully created effectively. Yeah. Like it felt like we were done, but then I was like, Oh yeah, we got to figure out what we can do too. Mm-hmm. But I feel like knowing all of the other things that we had picked, like all of those descriptive things made it easier for me to pick my abilities because I was like, these fit with Mm -hmm. all of these Mm -hmm. other blanks that I filled in. Like I felt less overwhelmed by the amount of choices because it was like, "Mm, that doesn't really fit what I've already put in these descriptions over here. Mm -hmm. You're not building a character around your abilities. You're building your character around the profile. Right. Exactly. And like, for my character, I made them young because I was like, okay, they're going to, they're young, they're leaving home, that kind of thing. And then when it got to the abilities, it was like, they're going to pick a bunch of different abilities because they haven't had time to specialize yet. They just know the beginning part of being the doctor, quote unquote. Hmm. I like that. Yeah, because I, I wasn't really even thinking about, like, my character as a wizard as I was creating the character itself. Um, I just kind of locked onto one thing and just built upon that. Tentacles? Yeah, tenta- yeah, <laughs> what, tentacles. What, what, yeah. Tentacles? <laughs> I I didn't even get that theme at all. I don't know. Uh, yeah, I just locked onto that and I'm like, well, how how ridiculous can I make this? How, how all tentacles in can I make this character? And And then from there, I was like, okay, let's pick abilities. And I don't think I picked aside from my familiar anything that had anything to do with tentacles well i was thinking about your character phil uh you picked a lot of teleportation abilities yeah which is very interesting because phil wants to get back to the future so there is a possible theory there that phil is from the future and his ability messed up and now he's in the past yeah I mean, that's kind of what I was going for when I yeah. picked Back to the Future is where I want to go is somehow I got stuck in the past. Is this the Disney Channel original TV show, Fill the Future? Yes. <laughs> but with tentacles. <laughs> future this is, future uh, is spelled with a PH. Yeah, this is the future where the tentacle monsters take over Earth. Um, and <laughs> Phil is one of those tentacle monsters. Uh-huh. But like a nice one. Yeah, a nice, a nice one. one. Yeah. <laughs> We're, we're the nice tentacle monsters that the other tentacle monsters put onto an island to say, hey, you do your thing on this island, and we're going to take over the rest of this world. Uh, and you then You can have your island. You can have your island. And then we're all the nice ones. And then uh, I just kind of got sent back in time somehow. <gasps> Maybe I'm supposed to stop them. <laughs> okay, now we're getting in the fanfic portion, and that's later on. So I apologize for that revelation. <laughs> Thank you for apologizing for your tentacle fanfic. (laughs) (laughs) Any fanfic about this character is tentacle fanfic. It is uh, required, I guess. I am holding my tongue. (laughs) I am (laughs) holding my tongue. Yep. (laughs) Because they've got tentacles. Is a tongue a tentacle? It's very very innocent. It's fine. I mean, kind of, (laughs) right? I don't like that image. Uh. <laughs> <laughs> Moving on. Why is that thought in my brain now? Uh, so how do the mechanics of character creation reinforce the feel of quest? I mean, it's the same sort of thing. Like, it's very the character creation. It talks to you very familiar, fa- 
in a familiar tone. There you go. Um, thank you. It's a step-by-step process. It walks you through all of it. And then once you have your character profile, you tell it to everyone else. And none of it's, like, angry or, like, here are the heavy, heavy rules that I do. These are the rules that I can do. These are all of my moves that I can do. Here's how high I can jump. Here's how far I can run everything. (laughs) That always feels like somebody's reading a textbook to you, too. When you sit down and they're like, I have a three in this stat and I can. And you're like, Mm -hmm. like my eyes just glaze over. Yeah. Like, Mm -hmm. I try really hard, but. (laughs) I've got these three skills, but this one's at expertise. And. Yeah. Oh, my God. I think I think where it really uh, shines is the descriptors that everything has. It's it's all very embellished and narrative and. uh like up uh, like you're reading prose so instead of like you're like i have a sword and a shield and this bow and arrow it is like i have a uh if i'm wearing fingerless gloves and a pendant filled with fireflies and i move with a joyful whistle like it forces you to be descriptive of what you're doing and really make your uh character unique in how you present them mm-hmm. instead of what they have And like Kyle said, it forces you to describe them in more than just single words, causing people around you to picture it more vividly. Um, And nothing's really treated as bad within the descriptors. There's nothing that's like, oh, you have a bad gait, you have a bad leg. Like, there's nothing that's like treated as a negative Mm -hmm. that you have in other games where it's like oh you have a minus to this modifier because your your people are stupid that kind of thing Mm -hmm. um which is a very prevalent thing in DD that is a discussion that's already happening in the community of like what negative modifiers mean and how that codifies your characters off the bat that Mm -hmm. kind of thing there's only one negative thing in the entire description. It's like, and it's like the obstacle that you are trying to work past to meet your goal. It's nothing like inherent about you that is like that you have no control over. Yeah, mm-hmm. it's your it's your character flaw. It's your to quote Greek mythology. It's your hubris, mm-hmm. depending on the type of character that you're playing. Like, mm-hmm. it's it's not a bad thing. It is just something that you need to be aware of. That like. Hey, it might trip you up sometimes. Yeah, absolutely. And and I like how it's not like a this is you all the time. It's just this is this is a flaw that kind of just gets in the way every now and then. Mhm. How does the process of character creation set a player's expectations for what this game is going to be like when they sit down to play it? I think that it sets up a situation where All the players may not know exactly what their city is called, may not know exactly all the names of all the people they've grown up with, that kind of thing. But they know enough to sit down and get started. And that's what the game's about. It's about being a starter RPG, the first one you play if you're new to RPGs. Mm -hmm. And I think that it sets that up really well to be like, okay, here's this open world, go explore. Like, it, it doesn't tell you you're stuck in this place, you can't go anywhere else, you're here. It tells you you're from this place, you're some, so you're now somewhere new, go, mm-hmm. have fun, enjoy yourself. Like it says in the beginning, open your mind, and let's begin. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I like how it, it feels like it's um, kind of gearing you towards the open uh, collaboration amongst the group uh for a lot of these things leaving a lot open-ended so that way when when discoveries are made um you're not feeling like you're bound to like well we're right here on this map page 43 of the world atlas book and we're approaching this city which is exactly 4.2 tiles away uh nothing like that it's all very much uh, kind of fluid in terms of uh, what's kind of in this world. I think it gives you this sense of limitless possibilities, mm-hmm. which is something that I th- I think a lot of us who play RPGs like about it is that it's like you can sit down and you can do anything. Mm-hmm. But I think games that are more um, – that are that crunchier kind of game – you get into a situation and the first thing you do is look at your character sheet and say, okay, what ability do I have mm-hmm. that 
can do this. And if I don't have an ability that fits the situation, you kind of feel stuck and you don't really know what kind of choice to make. Whereas the sense that I get from this building a character is that it's like, you can pick any of these things. They're all kind of out there and cool, but you can also make stuff up. Mm -hmm. And so I get the sense that like, it's okay for me as a player to go into any situation and creatively problem solve mm-hmm. rather than looking at my sheet and saying, I only have these six abilities. Yeah. If I can't use one of those, I'm useless. Yeah, I really I like mean, how this game kind of puts the discovery type of fun uh, more at the forefront uh, and mm-hmm. then p- takes the challenge type of fun and kind of puts that uh, more towards the back burner. Uh, sort yeah. of deal so you're not dealing with hex grids and and like distances and and all that sort of stuff it, it the the joy of discovery is extremely prevalent uh throughout the this whole uh core book yeah and, and one of the thing is that like if you remember your first time playing an rpg like this you ask questions that are out of the box all the time. You mm-hmm. ask, can I do this? Can I jump on this? Can I swing this? Can I, like, I have a player who every time I play with, they are, like, a new RPG player. And the fact that they're so creative, they see beyond what's going on. Mm-hmm. Um, they, during a combat, they spent a turn tying a rope to a ceiling rafter so they could hold their shield and turn into a wrecking ball and swing Amazing. downwards and knock <laughs> into people. And like, that's something that like, if you look at your character sheet, you can't do that. Like it's not on your character mm-hmm. sheet, but like first time players who are just being introduced to the games, like they ask if they can do anything. And it's amazing to see the difference. Um, one of the things that I like to try and remember nowadays when I play, when I'm not GMing, uh, I very often am the GM. Yeah. Uh, I try to remember that, like, act like a first-time player. Ask if something is possible, and if it is, do it. Mm-hmm. Like, do it not because it's the best strategy, not because it'll help you win, but because it's fun. And it's what your character would do in the situation. Like, do... Mm-hmm. Do the thing, like, don't hurt your party members or anything, because that's just a jerk move. But, like, do the things that are fun. Yeah, absolutely. All right, so what do we think is one of the biggest flaws of character creation in the system, and what's one of the best parts? Um, I kind of touched on this earlier with the, because the the character profile and the, uh, the what's it called, the worksheet is... Uh, is form fillable if you have the PDF version or you can write on it, but the, uh, there's no room for the abilities. And that's like the major flaw I see, which isn't really the process, but more like the format of it currently, um, is it's meant to have the cards as your ability where you keep track of your abilities, mm-hmm. but you can't really like have them on the sheet, which I'm, I'm trying to imagine like if that'd be a detriment to it, if it would be on there or if it would like, clog it up and make it feel more like a like uh amelia was saying like you look at it and it's like it's not on my sheet type thing Mm -hmm. but as just like a uh organizational standpoint i feel like that is would be something to improve upon yeah i i was thinking about uh it a little bit as well and and trying to format something like that unless it's completely free form and just like hey here just put your abilities in these floating fields um like oh well i'm playing the the wizard uh role so here's all your wizard paths now just circle the ones you have that would be mm-hmm. great but you also can hop between roles and pick from different paths on different roles and kind of create your own blended class so then that makes for kind of a messier type of sheet um, That's a thing that we talked about when we did our Starcross episodes too, about like the intentionality mm-hmm. of character sheet design <laughs> and like yeah, when you look at a sheet, it should tell you what you're getting into and in, like playing this game. So I think I get why the the abilities aren't on the sheet because it doesn't really point. fit that like narrative mm-hmm. part of the character profile. Mm-hmm. But I agree, like from a record keeping standpoint, I want to be able yeah. to remember what I picked. And so like mm-hmm. even sitting at the table and like playing with the cards, like if I come back next time, 
trying to remember what I picked before. Like, I want a place to jot that kind of stuff down. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I mean, speaking to the intentionality of character sheet design, I can easily see this being a completely intentional choice, Mm -hmm. saying the abilities that you have in the grand scheme of things don't matter. Mm-hmm. They right. they are what you can do, and sure, they're cool, but you can still do pretty much anything you set your mind to in this game, um, including working your way towards new abilities and legendary abilities, things like that. Um, and I, I would be uh, surprised if you can't create your own abilities and throw those into the game as well. Um, Russ is writing them. (laughs) Uh, So I'm working on... uh, So I'm going a little off topic from the flaws and good things. Um, I'm writing a speaker role, which is meant to be a sort of verbose bard sort of role, and a signatory, which is supposed to be the sort of warlock patron pact kind of role. Uh, Very excited about both of those. That's very cool. Um, But talking about a flaw... I think that this system is so freeform, it's so loose, it's so open, that a lot of more mechanic-based players who have a lot of experience will struggle with it, at least to start out Mm -hmm. with. I think that certain game systems kind of set your mind to... These are the rules. This is what we have to do. We can't do anything outside of that. Mm -hmm. And having that open space can be a little daunting, at least at first, of like, here's all this room for you to play rather than having, okay, I'd like it to be limited kind of thing and see what you can do. Mm -hmm. Um, It's one of those things of like having so many choices that it's overwhelming. Yeah. I don't know if that's so much a flaw because like, with any game of anything, you can't please everyone in the market. Mm-hmm. So with, there's there's no RPG that you that anyone can look at and say, "Oh, I love to play this game." Someone's gonna not like it. It's not gonna be someone's taste. When it comes to, like people with, like the crunchy stuff, like Pathfinder, D and D, Burning Wheel, all that stuff, like they're gonna look at this and be like, "Where's the numbers? I want like I want the war gaming. Mm-hmm. I want the the hexes and like the math to it." The but it's like this is more for the people who like the role playing the the role playing aspect of tabletop mm-hmm. role playing. Uh, they're mm-hmm. they're here for the narrative and for the stories and for the lore behind things. They're not here for the crunchy mm-hmm. semantics of battle. So so I'm more saying this in the sense of like the recent events that have happened with D and D, like people yeah. are looking for new systems. And so people who come over here, not because they're looking for a more narrative game, but because they're looking for a replacement, will look at it and go, ooh, this is too much. And I'm not Mm -hmm. saying that that's a, like, flaw doesn't necessarily mean a bad thing. Mm -hmm. It's more just like a a detractor, a reason why someone would look at it and not buy it. Mm-hmm. I was thinking that as we're going through this, that I'm I'm kind of surprised that this has popped up as the alternative to D&D um, mm-hmm. because it is so mechanically different. Like, other than the fact that it's both, like, generic fantasy, they have, like, nothing in common. And I, I'm very, like... I. The other thing, too, with D&D, though, is that a lot of people... I put a tweet out about this at one point, too, and I was like... Anybody can shift to a different game because chances are you're not playing D&D rules as written anyway. You probably house ruled the crap out of it. So, like, moving to this would be a little bit easier when you've already Mm -hmm. done that. But, like, it is a little bit surprising mechanically because it's it's so different. Mm -hmm. I think specifically uh, people who are, like, moving away from that we are aware of are, like, the people in like the podcasting, the streaming, like the the content creators who are making it for the stories, right? More so than the the mechanics. I don't know. Mm-hmm. I don't know what home game people are like. Well, actually, I do because I know people who play home games, and I try to talk to them out of D anD D, and they were like, "What do you mean? I don't understand." And I'm like, "Okay, <laughs> never mind." So, like talking about why people are switching over, I've seen several threads talking about why people are switching over. Kyle, I don't know if you've seen this. Um, some people are saying that Prison Pals is partially re- responsible for the podcasting sphere. Are you talking about Ajay saying it's Prison Pals? Ajay and Umar, Umar said that we were yeah. responsible. 
Um, and then Ajay. I mean, also- <laughs> trendsetters. <laughs> 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 Ajay, the creator of Bolt, also did Mm. a long breakdown of the quest system um, as a big tweet uh, back in, I believe, like May or June sometime. Mm -hmm. Um, And that tweet gained a lot of traction Mm. and like a lot of people saw it. So I think that's a large reason why like people in the ttrpg sphere at least podcasters creators that kind of thing not mm-hmm. really home game people have switched away from D to quest at least mm-hmm. um but yeah i i think that like even though the mechanics are so different i think the people who are in it for the narrative storytelling who are in it for the story not the not the actual gameplay mm-hmm. itself. Right. Will have a much better time playing it and are the people who are switching mm-hmm. over. Well, I can yeah. I can easily see somebody coming up with a like a, a challenge heavy uh module for quest uh through the creators uh packet the where where you add back the grid, you add back like uh ranges and and all that sort of stuff where positioning matters all that all that sort of fun strategic stuff that that you would get the, all the war gamey sort of stuff that you got with like traditional D and all that sort of stuff um i can see that kind of being able to kind of just attach itself to the core game of quest and and, and appease a lot of those players i agree with that but i think at least for our use of it, for like podcasting, yeah. and streaming, that kind of thing, having the sort of amorphous distances and like having things be more descriptive works a lot better for a the lot podcasting better. sphere. Oh, yeah. Because if you're like, okay, you are 30 feet away from this creature, yep. you move 15 feet this turn, 15 feet last turn, where are you now? The players can't see, I mean, the yeah. listeners can't see any sort of map or anything, so. Mm-hmm. I didn't ask how big the room was. I said I cast Fireball. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> yeah, Even it's. Almost time. Right, and and that's a very fair point. With, with podcasters, uh, uh, there's like maybe one or two podcasts I can think of that it, it feels and it sounds like they play on a grid during the podcast but they they're very good with the descriptions of where they're going and how they're doing things but they still adhere to the distances and and all that sort of stuff so you hear that sort of conversation going on but you take that crunchiness away and that's basically an actual play podcast right Mm -hmm. right so it, it feels very natural for ap's to actually go down the road of quest uh if you're going to be playing like a traditional fantasy uh, RPG. So the good side of quest, <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> especially character creation. Yeah. Yes. Uh, good side, especially character creation, is that I love the skill trees. I love, 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 love them because it allows to you to customize your character in such a interesting way. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Like. You can make the same fight. Like you could pick a fighter four times and make completely different fighters. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah, not just backstory, but abilities specifically. Like you could go all the way down one route. You could pick everything, like one from everything. Like it allows you to have a sort of flexibility and uh, an amount of choices that other games don't. Mm-hmm. Um, we've talked a lot about D and D because Quest is everyone's talking about it in relation to D and D. With D and D, you pick a subclass and you you stick with it. There are different options for subclasses, that kind of thing. But once you've played a subclass, you're not likely to play it again mm-hmm, unless right. there are more options that you haven't tried out, that kind of thing. Mm-hmm. But even if there are more options, a lot of them are very similar. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So it's 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 very much like recycling or rehashing the same things. Mm-hmm. Like several classes have subclasses that are just pulled from other actual classes Mm -hmm. like eldritch fighter or arcane trickster they're both wizards but steely or wizards but (laughs) hitty and and that's like how it works but a lot of the abilities for quest are completely different between each role Mm 
Mm-hmm. Yeah. Like, they're so diverse and so, I would say overwhelming, but overwhelming sounds bad. Mm-hmm. Um, unique. There's just, yeah, unique. Like, there's not really any pull from other classes where there's overlap. Mm-hmm. There are a few here and there. Um, like, I know there's a shield ability for the invoker, and there's the calcify ability for the doctor. But there are few and far between versus what I've seen from like D and D or other games. Mm-hmm. I think in the license TC specifically like mentions if you're building new roles like that, do not try to replicate something else. That like that ability belongs to that path and that role for a reason. Do not try to like mimic it or like reskin it. Just use it and reskin it like in the narrative there. Um, I also loved the idea of skill pass when coming into this because like prior to finding out about quests i was on the hunt or like about to build a game that used skill trees a la uh skyrim and the elder scrolls mm. because an rpg with that kind of diverse skill trees seems like so much fun to me but i also i realized in like in practicality it's a lot it's very clunky and very like finicky in that mm-hmm. sense so quests really uh scratches that itch in a proper way that doesn't uh, feel overwhelming. And um, in regards to like the versatility of the roles and like the replayability of it, uh, it is very much, um, it is very much like the only, only game I've seen that you can play the same roles in different aspects in different ways. Like there's no, um, and cause I play a lot of uh, PBTA too. That's like uh, outside of D and D PBTA was always my favorite. Like it remains my favorite. Um, and like anytime you play a PBTA game, you pick a playbook and like the, all the playbooks are like, have their options with the moves and everything like that. But like when you play a playbook, you're, if you're going to play it again, it's going to feel very similar because mm-hmm. when you play a playbook in PBTA, you have to play the game with the playbook in mind because you have to play into your playbook, mm-hmm. um, playing against it hurts you in those games so like you have to use the moves you're given and use the stats you're good at and and you going outside of the box kind of is detrimental in that sense mm-hmm. whereas this game going outside of the box is completely encouraged and makes your game richer and it makes your experience better altogether yeah it seems like it it, it just removes the walls of that box mm-hmm. for you totally and like there's rules built in to further remove it because it's like when you're building a role like when you're playing a character Use two roles. Use all the roles or no roles. Do what you want. Mm-hmm. We did the very basic character creation with just picking one role. We really yeah. did. Uh, I was Analyze very tempted. Abilities. Yeah, I was very tempted to to do some cross ability picking, but I'm like, eh, I'll I'll keep it basic for now. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Should we do our favorite segment of the show, Ryan? I, I think that sounds like a really good idea. I think Let's it sounds like a good idea. Talk about too. our group. Um, this is our fan fiction portion of the show where we decide what would happen if we actually played a game, the game that we'll never play. Um, <laughs> what a tease. <laughs> we'll live on. Yeah. This is where we get to like have the ideal situation where like no game gets all over our characters. Uh-huh. So um, we we did not build a world. We have a really uh, strange group of characters mm-hmm. I don't know what you're um, talking about. kind of from all over the place <laughs> so like like what do we want to do with this yeah it feels very like alice in wonderland or wizard of oz where your character amelia was like the protagonist in like this weird land and like it like comes so everyone's like a and uh, one by one comes along each of these characters, like starts off with like the teen beetle. Like, <laughs> all right, this is interesting. And then like, you get a tentacle person. You're like, all right, we're just finding all kinds of creatures. And then you get a city, you find a city of mist and a mist person joins your party. <laughs> <laughs> That's how I envision it. Just like steadily escalating weirdness. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I think Very it would girl be, on the ground. I think it would be really interesting if, um, if my character winked into existence in this time period, right at the beginning of play, like that's oh. how, that's how you meet me is, uh, where am I? What's going on? <laughs> Where's all my friends? How comic book of you. <laughs> <laughs> and, but I'm like, I'm like this super friendly, uh, tentacle monster that is, um, just kind of lost, but oblivious to a lot of things, I guess. So 
I, it just feels right to be like, okay, well, you're the first people that I've met in mm-hmm. this place. I don't even know if I'm on the same world uh, that I came from or the same time period, but I, I've got an inkling because technology is familiar but ancient here. I, I don't teen know where to go from there. Teen Beetle is a Teen Beetle. Teen Beetle is a Teen <laughs> Beetle. <laughs> um. So, Teen Beetle, the way I picture it, is that Teen Beetle lives in their home, and something happens, some sort of tragedy, and their people don't get involved, because it's safer to be neutral than to be involved, Mm. and rather than heeding the words of their elders and the people who tell them, don't worry about it, it's not our problem, they decide to get involved. Um, so they leave from home with their little bag of doctor's tools, which are their weapons, but also <laughs> their tools for healing. <laughs> and they just kind of jump into the world to try and solve problems. Um, and they're dumb. They're a himbo. Uh, <laughs> not really. But they they oftentimes don't really know what's happening in the world or why things are wrong or why things are right because they were never really taught that. They more just know, like, in their gut something feels wrong or something feels right. Mm. Um, so, for example, like, communal food is, like, a thing. So they don't understand why they have to pay for food at an inn or that kind of thing or, like, why they have to pay for goods. But they, like, understand good and evil in the sense of like intense morality like okay. hurting someone is bad um that kind of thing so do you think uh teen beetle and imogen would be kind of drawn to one another having that sort of like uh justice sort of mindset I don't know what Imogen would feel but I feel like teen beetle would be like ah yes this person knows morality I will stand with them and also yeah. hope I learn. Yeah, I mean, I, I'm in it for the heroism. I just want to be a hero. Um, but righting wrongs is, you know, that's hero stuff. So sure, we can. <laughs> 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 are you out to, like, fix a specific wrong? Or are you just like, no, I know what's good and I need to do good? I think that there's probably specific wrong that, like, they want to fix. Mm -hmm. But in the course to try and fix it or try to help with it, that's a longer path than, like, the start of the campaign. Mm. Like, that is, like, the overarching Mm -hmm. arc of the character versus the going from place to place to solve minor problems. Yeah. So how do we get uh, the mist uh, person and the tentacle person? Juice by Lizzo. You mean juice by Lizzo? Juice by Lizzo, yes. (laughs) So I open juice. my flask, and instead of juice, out comes juice by Lizzo. <laughs> well, I think juice by Lizzo is an outcast because uh, their their city is with all the mist people, uh, although very beautiful, um, is very uh, neutral, just uh, like a Team Beetle, uh, where the non hierarchical relationships and, and, pragma- and pragmatist uh, beliefs. But Juice by Lizzo has that wrathful side that, you know, they were the troubled teen growing up and they got a little too troubled and they got kicked out (laughs) of the city of mist. Um, And then they just went like on their own way. And they're just like they're very like optimistic and and pragmatist and like. I'm just here, and I I can murder you if I want to, but I won't. And I'm just here to have fun, but I'm not going to kill you because it's stupid. <laughs> and so I want to travel to the stars. That's that's reasonable, but there's an atmosphere, so I need to find someone who's magical. So it's very, very self-serving. I can see our characters kind of jelly very well in that sense, uh, since I've got like the magical sort of um, background, mm-hmm. and literally from the future. Uh, But now what's interesting is my character is over 3,000 years old. I want to say that I've traveled to a time in the past where there's a younger version of me in this world somewhere and um, may or may not cause a paradoxical uh, collapse of reality if we were to ever meet in person. (laughs) 
<laughs> your past self is coming to kill your future self. It's like that movie that I don't remember with Bruce Willis. Oh, uh, <laughs> yeah, Bruce Willis and uh, Joseph Gordon-Levitt. Mm-hmm. Uh, God, was that Looper? Uh, yeah. Oh, is it? Oh. I don't know. If this, I don't know if that one has Bruce Willis. I don't know. Regardless, I know what you're talking about. I was thinking more Back to the Future, though. Really? What made What made you think that? Because the whole uh, Marty McFly and the whole I dream of going back to the future, perhaps. Yeah, I know, right? <laughs> <laughs> I was thinking Phil of the future. Phil of the future. <laughs> well, it is Phil of the future. So I Phil trying I, to get back to the future. Yeah, I think my character's main drive is to try to stop the the evil uh people of the the tentacle people um i don't have a good race name i guess for for what i am squiggles squiggles the squiggles okay so the evil squiggles um i know that they're going to take over the world but i don't know exactly where we are in the timeline um and i don't have a full good understanding of uh temporal mechanics because i kind of spaced out during those classes fair um so i imagine that i'm just kind of uh bumbling along just trying to figure out a way and hopefully something happens upon us where i'll actually be able to to stop this uh this worldwide invasion Oh no, did the evil squiggles steal my artwork that I'm searching for? I would imagine so. I personally think that the squiggles, there are four types of them besides your type. Okay. And they're the couple colors of the wiggles. <laughs> yes. I was going to say, are they uh, so there's purple, Ninja red, yellow? <laughs> so there's five types of squiggles? <laughs> yes. Okay. And you are the fifth. Oh. Do they sing a song about fruit salad? Probably. I mean, the, of course. That's the war cry. <laughs> the war cry is a it's song. Called it's called calamari. <laughs> yummy, yummy. <laughs> I picture so I, in my head. Are they cannibalistic too? <laughs> calamari aren't squiggles. They're just you know everything in this planet in this future has like some kind of cephalopod. Yeah. Um, <laughs> uh, I picture uh, like. Phil is doesn't know about the uh, the mist people. It's like, oh wait, that's because the squiggles wiped you out. Now I have to convince you, the only the only mist person that has left the the city, to to go back and let, fight for it. And they're like, and to help your people that don't want you. Oh yeah, I like that. I like uh, throwing a little bit of destiny into the mix as well. So that's that's pretty cool. And maybe the event my people haven't gotten involved in has something to do with the squiggles too, their arrival or something. You remained neutral and let the world burn because you wouldn't take a side. Yep. Oh, yeah. Until I mean, you burned with it. That makes a lot of sense. Um, And then what, Imogen? Uh, there wasn't enough art in to inspire the people. <laughs> well, if the squiggles stole our art, our very important artifact. <laughs> uh-huh. Yeah, I mean, if you take Morale, away, if you take that away, th- maybe well. that's how they invade, is they take away the culture of the people, Ooh. and uh, and then that's slowly like kind of erode uh, these cultures down, because they live for such a long time. Is this just part of Despicable Me? Yes. I feel uh. like you've created Nazi squids. <laughs> that, okay, that does sound pretty bad, doesn't it? <laughs> I mean, I didn't think these squiggles sounded good. So I, I that is true. <laughs> <laughs> these are pretty evil squiggles. Oh, the squiggles. Oh, these poor squiggles. Scourge. <laughs> but we're the good ones. Well, at least yes. I'm part of the good ones. There's only like, you know, a few dozen of us, but we live on a nice island. I don't know, but I feel like you really have to earn our trust because we're not going to trust you because you are a squiggle. Well, nobody knows that the squiggles in this time period are the evil squiggles they're they're kind of in their period of waiting right now no one's ever seen a squiggle though so that's one thing to consider you would be making first contact oh yeah oh no everybody would think squiggles are good and then the bad squiggles will come and everybody's like hey you guys are pretty cool and then they're not and that's when the drilling begins The fracking begins. We got to start getting that oil and look, it's RuPaul the Squiggle. 
There is so much happening right now. <laughs> reference on top of references. You got to keep up. It's not the gay who's work. Oh, my God. <laughs> <laughs> this is and now a... we're Naruto running. <laughs> yes, <laughs> we Naruto run to break our alien friend Phil out of Area Fifty One. It's the camera pans. There's an explosion. Out of the explosion becomes RuPaul. The squiggles, <laughs> Naruto running in your direction. Oh no! <laughs> I, I think my brain Phil, can't process. Phil, this Phil's right just gonna break dance out of that. Yeah, that's the only way. Only way is dance battle. Dance battle. <laughs> a lip yep. sync for your the, life. Will. That is the only form of combat that the squiggles uh, recognize. A, a 50, 50 squiggle uh, dance battle is just uh, tentacles everywhere. <laughs> it's called a squaddle. A squaddle. <laughs> we have to find the Jabberwockies. <laughs> oh my god. <laughs> I feel like we've broken Amelia. <laughs> Quit this podcast. That's okay. Russ is taking over anyway. <laughs> I'm the new host now. Look at oh me. Oh my god. I'm the host now. I'm the host now. Uh, <laughs> oh, there's just so much happening here. Um, this is the chaos I mean, we bring. A guy would have a lot of strings to pull here, but... It's too much. It's too I think much. Ryan was the only one who heard that. <laughs> the Jabba Squawk. <laughs> no. The Jabba Squiggies. Nope. We need Sammy Metafig- Metafigilio to be the guy. I can't say their last name. Sammy, who played the the space squark in our <laughs> IPM game. <laughs> oh, <no. laughs> Uh, you'll understand their reference when International Podcast Month drops our episode this September. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Should we should we move on? <laughs> I think that was a pretty succinct uh, and fully understandable uh, fan fiction. I mean, honestly, we nailed it. We nailed it. Yeah. <laughs> there was nothing confusing about what we just said. So, uh, why add more to it? I want to read this right. transcription. <laughs> God. I can't oh. wait to read RuPaul the Squiggle. <laughs> oh. I really wish I could draw. Um, what a all. mood. <laughs> Let's get into our advancement segment and take it up a level. Take it up a level. Take it up a level. We didn't do that already? No. Oh. No. <laughs> Nope. We have not We've been on fan fiction. <laughs> that was all fan fiction. That was all first level. Let's take it up a notch, y'all. Yeah, we're taking it up a level. <laughs> this podcast goes to eleven. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. Well and it is eleven o'clock right now. <laughs> oh boy. So this is the last segment, and in this segment we will cover character advancement and growth in the system. Um, so how do you think characters change as people within the narrative of this game? So as people, um, I think that it's kind of like any other TTRPG where like characters are challenged and learn from those challenges and grow and change. And as they fail roles, as they succeed, they might change certain things on their character profile. Like you could change your flaw. You can change what you believe in. You can change what you look like. Or what you wear if you lose an item of clothing or you buy something new, that kind of thing. I think that as a character, a lot of the development comes from a narrative standpoint, not a mechanic rules oriented. You have this many hit points now. You yeah. have this many kind of things, especially with the use of adventure points, which just continue through as you complete a session. It just keeps going. Um, they don't, you don't ever like, aha, now you have a maximum of 20 adventure points you can hold, that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. It just keeps moving forward. So I think that a lot of the character growth comes from a narrative foundation. Mm -hmm. How does like, quote unquote, leveling up uh, work in the system and how did characters change mechanically? It's really, uh kind of customizable there's no like set rule like the basic rule is after every session you gain a new a new ability but uh that can be altered for long-term play or for uh if you 
want to just grant three abilities at once. I don't know. You can, mm-hmm. there's no set standard for advancement really mm. in this game because most of the things stay static. Like your profile stays static unless there's something in the narrative that changes it. Or your HP stays static. Your advent, uh, adventure points are uh, granted. They're not earned in a way. Um, mm-hmm. So the only thing that you really advance with is your abilities and what abilities you have. Okay. And if you get legendary abilities. So you can earn those pretty quickly though. I mean, yes. I, I suppose like depending on what your guide decides you want to do. Mm-hmm. But. So if you're going on the standard route, you can earn a lot of abilities really quickly. It's really good for like a shorter campaign like most PBTA campaigns are. It's meant to mm-hmm. be a shorter kind of game. You advance through it pretty quick and then you're done the characters, you're done the campaign. Um, it does have rules for like if you want to make a longer campaign kind of thing. Mm. Uh, what we're doing for Prison Pals is that... We're doing kind of milestone leveling, which we had already been doing in D&D, mm-hmm. where I'll be like, okay, you can get a new ability now. Or if a character discovers something or trains with someone or learns from someone, I will give them a new ability. Mm. Uh, for example, one of the things, because I love homebrewing, I'm a big homebrewer. I ad- adore homebrewing things because <laughs> I think it makes for, it allows you and a player to sort of customize what their character is more it allows that player to have more of a say Mm -hmm. in what that character can do and who they're going to be um rather than being stuck with the rules so one of the things that i've told people is that hey i've made additional learning paths because you've been taught by this tutor within the game or you've met this person within the game so one of our players has been taught by two different elemental spirits. So they have an ability for each of the elemental spirits Ooh. that they've learned already. And I've told them, if you choose to train with them again, I'll unlock another one for you and you will get that. Ooh. But that takes time from the game. That's like a choice. You have to make that effort to learn. Um, yeah. Which is also kind of how I'm treating legendary abilities. Like we said mm-hmm. earlier, legendary abilities are your capstone. Mm-hmm. Um I have custom abilities made for each of my players that I'm like, this is their legendary ability that they will get if they either meet these requirements or they do this thing that I think they might end up doing. Hmm. Um, So one of our characters, Kyle's character specifically, is being offered the chance to become like the chosen of two separate gods. Oh, wow. So I have two different abilities depending on if they choose either god. And there's another one that I'm not revealing yet because Kyle doesn't know about it yet. (laughs) Um, (laughs) But yeah, it's one of those things where like it's really easy to customize things and homebrew things for this game. It's also really interesting. uh, This is very similar like uh, Power by the Apocalypse where like advancement is all personal. Whereas in D&D and other games, it's all as a group you advance and take a step forward or it's uh, you uh, make, make get the experience that you are required to move forward. Um, whereas like in PBTA, you meet the requirements on your own and you take a step and you get a new ability. There's like there's no off balancing of a party like mm-hmm. someone could have eight abilities, someone could have six abilities and you can still be just as effective as each other. It's just you have mm-hmm. more options. Mm-hmm. It's it's interesting with those adventure points too. I can see that being a, a huge balancer mm-hmm. uh, between all these moves because if you have somebody that went all out on one path and they've got these really, really killer moves that take a lot of adventure points, you know, they're going to be able to do those maybe once, twice a session. Mm-hmm. And then they got to wait a session or two before they can do it again. Yeah. Um, compared to somebody that's doing all these first level things and they can do it maybe 10, 15 times a session, uh, which is interesting. It's very, very, it's, it's, there's very variable. Mm-hmm. And, uh, there's no, it's not very streamlined in that sense. Like everyone will be unique in yeah. how their, uh, their mechanics work based on how they, they play the game. Yeah. I can see this also working very well for, um, you know, uh, dropping players in or out uh, either through a narrative, uh, either retirement or whatever, and, and starting a new character or character death within the story, things like that. 
um, and then still being on equal playing ground. Mm-hmm. You're, you're technically, yeah. you know, quote unquote, level one, but you're, you're able to go toe toe with these, like, you know, quote unquote, level twenty uh, characters in your party. It's just you, your your range of options are less for your abilities. This would be a great game for like like the adventure league style play, like the um, the guild hall style play, where it's like you have twenty players, and it's like, all right, who's available for this session? Mm-hmm. I need five people, first come, first serve. Five people come in. All right, you have eight abilities, you have six abilities, you have ten abilities because y- y'all play different times, but you can all still do the same adventure. Base, it doesn't really matter. There's no mm-hmm. uh, combat rating, right? Uh-huh. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, that's really like, nice. Which there. There is, like, combat information. Like, there is discussion of how to scale combat, but it's not scaled in a way that's like, okay, how many abilities do they have? It has to do with how much hit points do the, does the party have in total, mm-hmm. and how hard do your enemies hit? Mm-hmm. Like, it, it doesn't... Because everyone's HP stays the same as, as players, it's much easier to scale. And it's much easier to figure it out rather than doing like, okay, what's the average party level? What's the CR of this monster? That kind of thing. Um, I'm speaking as a guy just because I I have to balance things for combats that might happen. Yeah. Um, and it gives you instructions like, hey, if you meet 80% of like what the players have as resources, you'll probably kill them. Uh, this mm. will probably be a deadly combat. Mm-hmm. Um, if you meet 100%, this they will not survive. Mm. Um, and it does a good job of defining those for you and like letting you know, hey, this is how the math works. Mm-hmm. And like Kyle said, you can have characters of any level together. And like Ryan said, like you can have 1 and 20 and it still works. Yeah. yeah. I think in that regard, it's actually a lot better balanced for like making encounters because when you think of D and D a DM needs to do all the math and the math that is like standard is based off a four person party of a certain level. And then all the numbers reflect those numbers. But if you go into a three person party or mm-hmm. a six person party, if you make that change, none of the numbers are applicable anymore. And the math mm-hmm. gets so much different whereas mm-hmm. this one the math is so basic and streamlined no matter who how many people you have in the group playing you can do it easily mm-hmm. yeah so i'm reading it right now for party it is you take the total of their health and that's it for the party for the monsters it's the hit points the highest possible amount of damage they could deal in a single turn and the number of monsters and then you compare the two numbers, mm. and then you do the math that way. Because um, if their number is higher than your party's total hit points, it won't mm. end well. Not yeah. Work. <laughs> yeah, that's that's really interesting how how they balance that. Then I like it. You're basically in second grade with the alligator with the yeah. alligator mouths with the less than greater than or equal to. <laughs> yep. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. Well, that sounds really cool. Uh, is there any last things that we want to talk about uh, about Quest before we, we wrap things up? Do we cover think, pretty much everything? Yeah, like the only thing I would like to say is like, because the big discussion with uh, everyone's moving away from D&D and moving and like there's a lot of j- people jumping ship to Quest. And like if people are like th- re- listening to this and thinking that, be mindful of what the story you're trying to tell is. Because Prison Pals chose to do quests and we're playing quests because we love it we clearly we love it we've we've recorded these episodes because it's such a great game and it does everything we want it to do but it's perfect for us because it does what it tells the story we want to tell well Mm -hmm. when other people are playing D and other games and like looking at like quest if it doesn't tell the type of story you want to tell don't play quest just because it's a great game and it doesn't mean it tells a story you want to tell like Mm -hmm. people like People are constantly playing D and D and other games and like hacking it and changing it and like modifying it when they could be easily looking for other games. Like if you're trying to play a wrestling, like a a lesbian less wrestling uh, uh, show, like don't play Quest. Quest ain't gonna right. work for you. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's the thing that we emphasize a lot on the show too is that like certain games are meant to do certain things, mm-hmm. and like if you try to bend it to like a different 
that like it's just not going to work. Yeah. Like mechanics reinforce the like style of play and the kinds of stories you're mm-hmm. supposed to tell. So going off what Kyle said, like uh, specifically looking at why we at Prison Pals chose it, it's not only because of it fits our story, it's also because it fits our show. Like mm-hmm. it is a simpler system, so it's easier for a younger audience to understand. Mm-hmm. It is a very wholesome, light, enjoyable system, which fits our all ages theme. Mm-hmm. And like the art is beautiful and like features rainbows very heavily in the designs of characters mm-hmm. and everything, which isn't like a huge thing, but it, it's still like like pretty art does yeah. make it more attractive. Mm-hmm. And oh, like totally. Yeah. And, like, it does a lot of the work that D&D never did for us. Mm-hmm. Of, like, us having to change the rules and having to modify things, that kind of thing. Mm-hmm. And Kyle mentioned, well, if you're trying to play a lesbian wrestling game, don't use Quest. I will go even closer on that. If you're trying to play a grim, dark fantasy game, don't play Quest. Mm-hmm. Like, Quest very much is not built for that sort of game or that sort of sort of setting where you have to count resources you have encumbrance that kind of thing mm-hmm. it's not built for it it's built very much for a sort of light-hearted and brighter story you can still tell a dark story in it but like your no characters curse of Strahd, no out of the abyss don't do that kind of stuff yeah <laughs> you yeah. won't have like <laughs> your characters won't have the same grit and their abilities won't have the same grit that other systems would mm-hmm like, Urban Shadows has great grit in it of, like, using debts, calling in favors, manipulation techniques of other characters, political. players, political intrigue, that kind of thing. Quest doesn't have that. Like, the Spy has some moves that lead into that, but it's not, like, as emphasized. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. It's called Quest because it's about a quest. Make a game about a quest. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. Well... Kyle and Russ, thank you both so much for joining us to talk about Quest. This was fantastic. This was so much fun. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Okay, can you remind everyone where they can find you online and what sort of things you're working on? I'm first this time, Russ, in case you're not looking at the thing. Thank you. (laughs) I was looking at everyone's faces. I'm sorry. I have that dual dual, dual monitor set up. so uh, our show is Prism Pals. You can find us uh, on Twitter at Prism Pals. You can find us on any podcatcher, uh, Prism Pals. It's really uh, easy to search. Just don't spell prison. We're not in prison. It's a prism. Mm-hmm. <laughs> <sighs> like Subtitlers hate when we say prism. They're always say like, prison pals. Um, <laughs> <laughs> That's a very different thing. Yeah. Uh, it, it, there's also worse things it's done, too. Um, but anyway, uh, I am on Twitter at super underscore that's super queero. It's ingrained in my head now. That underscore will never that will never leave me. That's super queero. Um, I do things on off the table on their podcast and their streaming channels. Um, I I made my first game called College and Keg Stands, where it's a drinking game RPG. It's it's a fun time. It's, <laughs> it's a fun time. But yeah, come check out all of our stuff. Uh, hi, I'm Russ Wild, and you can find me on Twitter at Russ Wildest. Uh, you can find me streaming on twitch.tv slash prism pals with prism, not prison. Um, <laughs> <laughs> uh, me and a fellow player, Mariam, are currently streaming Cat Quest 2. We're taking a little break because of Gen Con and things coming up, but online Gen Con and things, but we'll be back beginning of August. This will be out. Um, Yes, I know this will be out. I know we'll be back by then. (laughs) Um, But, uh, yeah, I'm also a writer sometimes. I didn't mention this before. I've written for Unbreakable, Mm. a D&D 5e anthology. um, And I'm working on quest roles that I'll finish eventually. Very nice. Well, thank you again, both of you, for sitting down with us. And thank you to everyone for tuning in. Character Creation Cast is a production of the One Shot Podcast Network and can be found online at www.charactercreationcast.com. Head to the website to get more information on our hosts, this show, and even our press kit. Character Creation Cast can also be found on Twitter at CreationCast, 
or on our Discord server at discord.charactercreationcast.com. I'm one of your hosts, Ryan Bolter, and I can be found on Twitter at Lord Neptune or online at lordneptune.com. Our other host, Amelia Antrim, can be found on Twitter at Ginger Reckoning. Music for this episode is used with a Creative Commons license or with permission from the podcast they originated from. Further information can be found within the show notes. Our main theme music is Hero Remix by Steve Combs and is used with a Creative Commons license. This podcast is owned by us under Creative Commons. This episode was edited by Ryan Bolter. Further information for the game systems used and today's guests can be found in the show notes. If you'd like to leave us a rating or review, we have links to various review platforms out there, including Apple Podcasts, in our show notes. Also, check the show notes for links to our other projects. Thanks for joining us. And remember, we find that the best part of any role-playing game is character creation. So go out there and create some amazing people. We will see you next time. We gotta read some show blurbs. Show blurbs. Show blurbs. Show blurbs. Show blurbs. Character Creation Cast is hosted by the One Shot Podcast Network. If you enjoyed our show, visit oneshotpodcast.com where you will find other great shows like All My Fantasy Children. Each week, Aaron Katana Saez and Jeff Stormer take a listener submitted prompt and, using some of their favorite tabletop RPGs, create an original fantasy character. Along the way, they share laughs, stories, verbal hugs, and populate a shared universe one story at a time. I did it. Excellent. I put the microphone closer to my face, though. Also have waveforms. I am going to adjust my gain slightly. I feel like I have to adjust my settings every time we record, and I don't understand why. Hello, hello. Uh, That's because you got a Yeti. Okay. Wow. (laughs) <laughs> Rude. <I don't> Attacked. <laughs> hey, somebody didn't buy me a fancy microphone. Well, so. if you would just break yours on accident, then... Okay, I will break mine on accident, <laughs> and then I can email James. James, please buy me a fancy microphone. Yeah, my Yeti just broke itself. What the heck? Nah, it's fine. I, I blame this faulty arm and the ginormous weight of the Yeti. Mm. Um, And it completely destroying the cord that goes right into it, so... Fair. Yeah. All right. Uh, so, any questions before we begin? I'm good. Okay. Cool. Y'all said Amelia. Yeah. Totally. Okay. Just born ready. <laughs> Just kidding. I'm taking another sip of this root beer. I really excited uh, to learn this because uh, I was I was looking over the rules just very slightly, which I normally don't do, uh, but I really enjoyed it. So, I'm excited to pretend I know what I'm talking about. <laughs> right, Russ. Right. <laughs> I mean, more of a feeling. I read the entire rule book for Prison Pals, so there's that. Listen, I always read the character creation part, which is all I, I need know. for this show. I exactly. <laughs> That's all right. All yep. right, I will do a five count, and then we will go ahead and jump right in. Uh, I'm fishing something out of my pocket. Hold on. Okay. Right. <sighs> ah, sorry. I didn't want to be weighted down by my wireless headphones. Actually, that reminds me. I should. Turn my phone volume down too. That's what I was doing too. My family likes to text me. Okay. Oh, yeah. oh man, I would play that in a heartbeat. Totally. <laughs> I would Believe too. in the heart of the cards. <laughs> All right. I want a Millennium Puzzle. <laughs> Summon the Blue Eyes White Dragon. <sighs> oh my God. What a good game. What a good game. <laughs> Oh, what a Christ. ridiculous show, though. <laughs> I, the show was, I was re-watching it recently because my kids found it on Netflix, and I was like, this is not good, and I it's loved not. it so much, <laughs> so partner, much. My partner rewatched it, and I, I didn't remember the capsule season, and I was like, what is happening? <laughs> I, I think There's I, so much going on. I think I remember ironically loving it. Like, I knew it was bad at the time when I was a kid, but I didn't care. I still loved it. Yeah, it's valid. I rem- I don't remember watching the season, but I know that there's a season where there's racing and oh, language going on. Uh, language. Oh, sorry. I know that. <laughs> thank you.
<laughs> I know that there's a season where they have like racing on motorcycles and they're like dueling while they're racing and that's not a, that, that's not a season that is the series that's the third series because there's Yu-Gi-Oh there's Yu-Gi-Oh GX <laughs> there's Yu-Gi-Oh 5G that's the racing on the motorcycles one and there's Yu-Gi-Oh Zexel and uh, Yu-Gi-Oh something else but I didn't watch the other two but the first three I watched well, see, so you're not- just like only kind of a nerd, not like a big nerd. <laughs> you know, yeah, yeah, kind of. <laughs> just a little bit. <laughs> I used to be so good at that game, though. Like, well, I guess now good. we're going to be exploring the Yu-Gi-Oh module of Quest this episode. <laughs> <laughs> Welcome to our new Yu-Gi-Oh podcast. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> awesome. Did you print out the character sheet? Yeah. I'm jealous of you having a printer that works. Yeah, I just bought a new one because mine doesn't work either. Well, mine. I um, mine works. just set mine up, and I like end up having to use it a bunch for work now. Oh, um, but my yeah. family's printer broke, and they found out that I have a printer up here, and oh, so no. now they like make me print stuff all the time. <laughs> I have the f- a, I have a really nice laser printer, but the cartridges that I have are garbage. So it has mm. like a streak of pink and blue that goes but- across the whole length of the page, and I don't want to pay two hundred dollars to get new cartridges. So Kyle just yeah. smacked his mic. No, that was that me. Was, oh, okay. Could that I? That was me. I was trying to unmute it and I whacked I thought it was it. you because you'd already done it once. Could recorded. I trouble you then, Kyle, for uh, the fixed character uh, Totes form for the goats? I will drop it in our chat. Awesome. Where did that pen? That, that because I'm like, oh, no, you're right. I entered in something and it copies for everything else in that field. Yeah. We weren't lying. I know. <laughs> Let me. That, uh, that's a very easy. I've done PDFs like that before, uh, especially like I, I created character sheets for Palladium, mm-hmm. uh, like Universal <laughs> Palladium character sheets, which uh, yeah, I don't recommend doing that. Um, and when I filled in one skill the first time I used it, it filled in all my skills with that. And I was like, no. Fun. Uh, I learned we my lesson that. back in 2000. One? Yeah. (laughs) Well, they should have called you. I know, right? All right. They should have a drive link in the Twitter. Okay. Let me go to my Twitter's request access. Oh. Uh, Should I do? How dare you, Kyle? Should I not do this? access? I thought I did that. (laughs) Uh. Uh, I feel like, I don't know if it's Google or Dropbox. There's one of them that I swear I have to do it twice every time. Hey, it's working. There you go. Um, Add. I would like to download this, please. Shazam. Please, somebody. I got it. Yay. Hey. Now let me, let me just test it out. Okay. Sweet. It works. I opened <laughs> the right one. Cool. So, uh, in the meantime, if you want that, uh, reach out to Kyle. He'll hook you up, probably. Yeah. <laughs> you have to follow me on Twitter. You have to follow me on Prison Pals. You have to uh-huh. subscribe to my podcast, and then I'll let you have it. Yep. <laughs> I, I have done all of those already, so. You need a verification status. <laughs> That's why Ryan gets it and Amelia doesn't. Oh, <laughs> harsh. Um, I'll just so. use a pencil like a loser. <laughs> Like you're in the dark ages. <laughs> That's the old school form fillable character sheet. <laughs> um, as, as an aside, I have decided the word chunks is worse than the word moist. Okay, so I have a theory about this. I would like to discuss this. Everyone is upset about the word moist when the word that they should be upset about is soggy. Because soggy implies something that is wet that is not supposed to be wet. Uh-huh. My mom has a gag reflex specifically for that word. It's not even a joke. <laughs> there was a bad Thanksgiving where people would not stop saying it. Oh, no. Oh, no. <laughs> okay, that is a pretty bad word, too. Yeah. Moist is good because, you know, cake. Like a good cake? Yeah. Moist. A soggy cake? Bad. Yeah, very that bad. A good cake. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Ooh. Good cake. I remember, there was one time that I couldn't remember. I was trying to describe a cake as being moist, and I couldn't remember the word. And I was like, I don't want to say juicy. <laughs> <laughs> got that juicy cake. Like, cake yeah, my ex husband so and I would like joke all the time. He's like, "These cupcakes you made are really juicy," and I was like, "Gross." <laughs> I love it. Hey, if you have fresh fruit in your cake, could then be, it could, could be, be juicy. juicy. Otherwise, cake 
Not supposed to be juicy no. or soggy. <laughs> Just to be clear, the level should your wet. fruit be moist? Okay, wetness. Your fruit could okay. be moist. Yeah. Uh, Kyle said, "What's your dream?" And for a moment, I started playing that song from Rapunzel. Where everyone talks about their dreams. <laughs> I've got a dream. You didn't go to Shark Boy and Lava Girl. Dream, 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 dream. <laughs> Don't laugh at that, Ryan. <laughs> <laughs> Not while I'm drinking water. Yeah, please don't. <laughs> That's how you get need a second mic. Uh-huh. I would need a third one at that point. Correction. Better than a revenant named Blueberry. Is that a thing? Yes. Love that. In the other Urban Shadows campaign, there's a revenant named Blueberry, and I'm just like... Oh, language! What is this name? <laughs> language. We'll cut that out. We'll cut that. What the heck is this name? Did you not read the the the, the thing they sent us that said <laughs> I'm don't, sorry. we don't want to edit out your cursing? I read I'm it. Sorry, I'm bad. Ryan, you're gonna have so much dog barking to edit out. That's okay. Bork, bork, boys. I don't know what her deal is, but there might be somebody walking on her street. How dare they? <laughs> don't they that know is, this is her street? That's her territory. Bark, bark. Clicky, licky. <laughs> I just, it's finger clicking good. <laughs> that's that's what came into my brain when you said clicky, oh. licky. Uh, no. So you're welcome, internet. Nope. <laughs> this all stays in. <laughs> Gross. <laughs> this better go in the outtakes, Amelia. I will do my best. <laughs> we'll see. If I, if I don't just black out. Like editing the episode and actually delete the song. Cut the whole all. beginning and like. <laughs> and your lotion. <laughs> and your Absolutely. lotion. Uh, so I've got uh, Gold Bond. Ult- no, okay. <laughs> I do like that kind, though. I feel like that's good lotion. I know you said it's not as good as your upstairs lotion. But... <laughs> well, my upstairs one is specifically for eczema, and this one is just healing with aloe. Oh, it's just regular. Uh, it's just got regular. It. It's, it's not bad. It's a little thicker than the other one, uh, it goes on a lot nicer. Makes it a little bit more smoother and it's less oily, but it's juice by Lizzo's cousin, healing with aloe. <laughs> I healing have this with paraffin a- one from Bath oh, and Body Works for hands, nails, and cuticles. So, <laughs> welcome to our lotion podcast, um, where we'll be discussing the lotions that we currently have and ASMR applying them to ourselves. <laughs> Do you have, like, have a helping Cetaphil? hands downstairs? It's like the, it's this one from Lush that's specifically made for people who frequently <laughs> wash their hands. It's very good. Well, like O'Keefe's working hands. <laughs> I got it for my mom because she's a nurse. <laughs> Ooh, nurse grade. It's nurse grade lotion. <laughs> <laughs> oh my gosh, I'll put this all in the outtakes too. Oh nope, gosh. we're keeping those in for the outtakes. <laughs> <laughs> Producer Russ said keep it. Okay. Right. So uh, we're going to go from lotions to tentacles. Putting my contact pick it back in, but I'm just moving off frame so you don't see me touch my eye. <laughs> oh, thanks. <laughs> I, I very much appreciate that. Yeah, I, so like in my aside, in my Tinder dating profile, I have like, <laughs> like tabletop RPGs, and everybody's like, "Oh, what do you what do you love about D and D?" And I'm like, "I have played D and D all of like six times, and I hated it. Like, <laughs> I don't play D and D. I can tell you why D and D is bad if you want to talk about that, but like." <laughs> <laughs> oh my just change that into your phone my, my last date was like a lot of me telling her all the problems with D&D and we didn't have a second date so <laughs> so like 